What's up, guys? Today, we're doing Baker Mayfield against the Seahawks of crippling, game-ending interception fame, right? As you might guess, I believe there's a little bit more nuance to this thing than just Baker threw a game-ending pick, he's bad. I think you gotta watch all the film, and that's exactly what we're gonna do. He was under a lot of pressure, he missed some throws, he made some throws. Let's see what it's all about. First, before we watch the film, let's talk about how I grade. Six buckets. We got the elite throws. These are downfield bombs on a dime, Josh Allen type stuff. It's the kind of stuff that very few quarterbacks can do and almost no one can do consistent. A great throw is, you know, a very deep ball that's catchable, but maybe not perfectly placed. Or it's like a perfect second level throw, like 18 to 25 yards downfield. All of these are subjective. So the yards I'm giving you are just guidelines. Everything is malleable. Everything is context based and totally subjective. So somebody in a different video said, this is all just speculation. And I said, yeah, that's what scouting literally means. A solid throw is a positive throw that's not that difficult to make. It typically manifests itself in like 8 to 12 yard throws down the field past the line of scrimmage. Uh, or they can just be accurate throws on coverage bus, right? If a wide receiver runs a streak and the cornerback falls down, a throw that's accurate and gets to that receiver and lets him just take advantage of the cover bus, that's good, right? You got to give him credit for reading the play out and being accurate, even if it's not a perfect ball. Bad throws are ones that are just inaccurate or if they get batted. If a ball should be caught by a good starting defensive back, that's a pickable. Pickables don't always get picked. They're interceptable. That doesn't mean they're intercepted. And not all interceptions are always interceptable. Sometimes it's just bad luck, a deflection, a dropped ball, whatever. Most throws, almost every throw from almost every quarterback is going to be a pedestrian or routine throw. These are the things you expect your quarterback to hit, even if it's a backup. Checkdowns, quick hits, RPOs are typically pedestrian. I also grade the things that aren't just throws. The most prevalent one is going to be a positive pocket movement. This is any time that a quarterback extends the play or changes the launch angle to benefit the offense. Running around for no reason isn't positive, but in cases where it's actually helpful, you get a plus move. I also break sacks into ones that are the quarterback's fault and ones that aren't. I grade throwaways separately from all the above throws because, and then I break runs into positive, neutral, and negative. Neutral runs are about as effective as a check down. Positive runs are probably about 10 yards or more, and I give bonuses the further they are downfield. And then a negative run is anything that hurts the team. It's uh, fumbles, really easy. Did the quarterback fumble? I don't care who recovers it. If they fumbled, it's a fumble. So without further ado, let's get to the film. This game's going to start on a short field after a Geno Smith interception. And Baker's going to roll out. This is this is a one-read play. It's supposed to just be to the tight end. Baker rolls out. This is plenty of room. He just puts too low of a trajectory on it. I know he's trying to be careful. If he tries to loft this ball by popping it over that free rusher, this linebacker is going to hit this tight end even quicker. Or maybe it's a defensive back. It doesn't matter. So I understand what he's trying to do, but... It's still a bad throw. I'll give him a plus pocket movement because he's obviously being very rushed, but it's bad. It's pretty rare that a batted ball is defensible. Here is a plus move. He's fading away while he does it, but it's a routine throw and it's not enough. Frankly, I think Sean McVay's a bitch for not going for it on 4th and 3 this close to the t end zone, but what do I know? I'm not the one about to retire. Next drive. By the way, I'm going to get this out of the way early. If it sounds like I had a rooting interest in this game, I did, but it's probably not the one you're thinking. I wanted the Rams to win because I thought it'd be really fun to see the Lions in the playoffs, and the only way that that could happen is if the Rams won. So I was a little biased. Here, this is a no-fault sack. Baker can't even get out of his play fake before there's a free rusher on his ass. I think number eight is Carlos Dunlap, but that does not look like Carlos Dunlap. It looks a lot more like Kobe Bryant. I don't know. Uh, Kobe Bryant out of Cincinnati, not the basketball player, RIP. But as you can see, the entire line shifts left for the protection of the play action. And it leaves two offensive linemen here just with their dick in their hand and a free rusher off the edge that should have gotten picked up. These are the kind of protection modifications I don't know if it's reasonable to expect Baker to make. I don't even know if he has the authority to make them because he is still so new to this team. But one way or another, it's a no-fault sack. Here, this is a really good run. Now, it's not a first down, but it is 10 yards, and he breaks a couple tackles doing it. Baker Mayfield's not going to confuse anybody for Lamar Jackson. But good job on the pitch. That's a positive run with a positive movement for breaking a tackle. Here, this is a negative sack. I don't know what the hell Baker's doing. This is another instance of we don't need all 22 to see everything going on. Look at this. So... 
I know his read, his first read is going to be 2-2 Atwell out here probably on an out, but you have this in just screaming at you over the middle of the field, and it's not coming uncovered. Look to your second receiver, buddy. If you really like Atwell that much, just throw the ball out there. He's got leverage. I don't know what he thinks he's doing. At this point, it's too late. I, mean, I guess he could be looking at this corner down here, but... Dude, it's third and three. Get the yardage. You have three dudes. You had Tutu out well while you were looking that way. You had this guy, I think that's Van Jefferson, the entire way. And now you got Brandon Powell down here, number 19, coming open late. So even right here, he's fucked up all play, right? He's fucked. He missed that. Well, it's over. He missed this guy. It's over. He still has Powell. Gun it in there low. Put it on his knees. He'll catch the ball and slide. He won't get killed. Instead, Baker takes a sack. That's a terrible sack to take. It's gross. I don't like to see it. They're going to pretend like Bruce Irvin did something here, and maybe he did, but what really happened is Baker was late on what should have been a quick hitter. That's how you kill a drive. Drive one was underwhelming, albeit short. Drive two was almost as short and very underwhelming. So far on the day, he's only got that one positive run going for him. Let's see if he can tune things up. Starts to get back in rhythm with a routine throw. Cam Akers doing his thing. That's fun. Cam Akers, by the way, I, I, I don't know if Baker Mayfield is like his secret best buddy, but he started playing way better when Baker came to town. I don't think that has anything to do with Baker. Correlation does not equal causation. It's just an observation that Cam Akers, the last like month and a half, has looked like the Cam Akers of FSU, the Cam Akers that I was really excited to see in Sean McVay's offense. You know, before he just tore his leg apart for two years. Third and three. Rams go empty. And here again, this is on Baker. It's third and three. Again, you've got a slant right here. That's open. I understand that the play side is to the left. So throw it to Higby. He's open on an out. Hit him. Hit him. Nope. Baker panics, pulls the ball down, and makes a negative run. This is a really bad play. Sure, I'll give him a plus move because he broke a tackle. But you've got to make that throw. That's bad. That's really bad processing from Baker now on two consecutive drives that ended them. And that's something that you might expect from a quarterback that's new to an offense, but this is the least new to this offense he's been all year, and it's the first time we're seeing these issues. So I don't really know what's going on. On to drive four. Little play action, boot left. Good job to get your body around and throw it. It wasn't the most easily caught ball, but it was catchable. That's a routine throw. I mean, it, 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 if it hits you in the bicep, you should probably catch it. It could have been out to the uh, to the outside shoulder a little bit more. Fine, but I'm not going to nitpick ball placement on a three-yard throw that hits the dude. Same routine play. Here, all the time in the world on third and seven, and Baker throws a pickable. Now, there's a flag for holding, but I don't think that it has anything to do with this play. They'll show you the replay here, and it's honestly, it's depressing. Because Baker has looked really bad to start this game. Here you'll see that the holding comes on the opposite side of the play. So they're running... This is a zig, right? This guy's coming in and out. And then this guy's running like a seven route. And this guy's running some kind of an over route behind it. So Van Jefferson is the eventual target. He's double covered. The holding happens out here. Now, Baker is excited that he gets the, the holding call because it gives him a second chance. But that's a pickable ball. If I'm missing something, let me know. But that was bad. I can splice in the all 22 just to be sure, but that's a routine throw. In fact, I'll make note. I'll throw in the all 22 of that one. All right, some more play action, roll out right, nothing's there, and Baker does a really good job of making a play here. So this is two pocket movements, one for the flip and one for getting out of the pocket, and a routine throw, because it was underhanded. Anybody can do that. Sure, there was a hold behind the play, but it was behind the play, and I didn't think that it affected the play. 
Here, another routine throw on third and 18, and the Rams will punt. And 31 will not be able to stop the ball from going in the end zone. That's a recurring theme in this game. All right, let's start off by diagnosing the defense, because that's what Baker should be doing on this play as well. To me, with the benefit of hindsight, I guess, this really looks like a robber coverage. A robber coverage is like cover two, except in... Okay, cover two would be... Man across, right? And it looks like we have press man across the field. We got here, 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 and then here, right? That It looks like those corners and Jonathan Abram are going to be manning up against these wide receivers, and it looks like this linebacker is going to take care of the running back with four rushers. So a pretty standard defense. Now, the single most standard defense in basically all of football is just too high man. Right, so it's all the man across, like we said, and then the safeties would be doing this. Instead, because these safeties are staggered, it tells me this one is in robber coverage, and he's going to run up here. And then this one's going to go into single high. I guess Baker sees it differently, because he doesn't quite react that way. Now that we know what the defense is going to look like, this is what the routes are going to look like. This is what the pass pattern is. All right, now let's run the tape. As you can see, it looks like I was onto something, right? Everybody's manned up. Linebacker is patiently waiting for the running back to clear. This strong safety is coming down into the box, playing a robber coverage, taking away the you know middle portion of the field. And this deep safety is playing halo coverage, just trying to make sure nobody gets behind him. Now, you could throw this ball to Higby. I mean, that's a really long throw and, and not a lot of separation. It would have to be perfect. Here's the illegal contact that, should, that would have theoretically taken Baker off of this route. But the problem is, Baker's not even looking that way. He's looking at Van Jefferson the whole time. And Van Jefferson's open right now. So if the ball is already like where my mouse is, if it's already in the air, this would have been a good throw. But Baker's late. And... Because he's zeroed in on this receiver, I guess he doesn't notice this robber defender. It's called robber for this exact reason. This is literally why the defense is drawn up. Baker thinks he can get it there, and maybe, maybe he could. But the robber makes a good play. Personally, I'm going to throw the ball right now to the underneath leverage of Van Jefferson, having a little bit of anticipation. One, two. Or I'm going to just try to throw this ball right about where my mouse is to Higby and hope that he can go moss this dude and make up for the lack of separation. Because if that ball is in the air and hits Van Jefferson like right here, like right where this X is, he has a chance, but it's just late. He gives the this safety enough time to set his feet and come back to the ball that's how you get picked off man he's really lucky all right drive five rams are still alive let's see if baker can finally put something together he's five of seven for 36 yards that looks real accurate but we know better because we've been grading the film right it's not been a good half for him until now this throw is great now, I know what you're thinking. It doesn't get caught. It looks like the tight end dives. First of all, he gets two pocket movements because he's under pressure while rolling left. Like, right away, there's a dude on him. He can't set his feet. He can't slow down for a second. He's got to be running. He's got to get his shoulder around. He does both. And I actually paused it pretty well. You can see the ball in the hands right there. I'll show you the all 22 so you can see a better view of it. But this should have been caught if you ask me. All right, fuck it. Let's go to the all 22 real quick. You'll see there's backside pressure right off the boot. Uh, that's really jargony. What that means is that this defensive end is going to get a free rush. He's not really going to get blocked. And Baker's going to roll away from him. And he's going to be chased the whole time. So he doesn't have the ability, the luxury rather, to set his feet and make a positive throwing platform. Instead, he's got to roll out as fast as he can. And he's got to get his shoulders around on the run. That's two plus movements because that's really hard to do. 
and now we've got a pretty tight coverage, but a receiver that is fairly open. So as long as you get the ball up and down into this window, it's going to be open. This safety is crashing down. This linebacker is taking the underneath, so you can't gun it in there. You kind of got to float it over. It's a pretty tough throw, and if it, if it lands, it'll be great. Here you can see the linebacker just barely nicks the ball, and that's a really good play by the linebacker. I'm imp Honestly, that's not an expected play. And even still, it lands perfectly on the receiver's outstretched hands. I'm of two minds on this play. On one hand, it clearly does get tipped, right? Look at that. On the other hand, it's still really accurate. And it takes a really good play just to get a small finger on it. It's tough for me to say that this is no longer a great throw because a linebacker made a really good play to barely touch the ball and it still hits the receiver in the hand. I'm going to downgrade it to solid because it isn't great, right? This is the same as if the ball placement was off and made the catch a little harder. It's still accurate. It took a really good play to stop it, but it isn't perfect. And that's why it can't be great. So that ball was iffy on the great, right? Like maybe it got tipped by the linebacker and therefore it shouldn't be great even though it still hit the receiver in the hands. Fine. This one, definitely great. Line of scrimmage is the 17. Ball gets caught at the 36. Absolutely. 20 yards downfield in stride. Perfect. Great throw. Baker's about to put together a little string here. That, that first one, you could argue it was just solid. The second one, definitely great. Here, we'll play action. On the money. Now you're going to say, but he didn't catch it. And I'm going to say, Pum. yeah, that's why Brandon Powell is a reserve player that barely plays on the practice squad. Let me show you the L22. This kind of looks like watching Pee Wee football where the kids have helmets that are like bigger than their whole body. They look like bobbleheads and they can't really move around so good. So passing is just useless. I don't know why Brandon Powell is tracking this over his right shoulder, but okay. You, you should, you, at this point, when the ball is this close to you, you should start having your head like looking up, right? Rather than over your shoulder. But okay. Here, Brandon Powell, you see his legs start to bend in. He's falling. He trips because he looked so far over his right shoulder that he, he fell. It's a perfect ball. It's a perfect ball. It lands a couple feet away from him, despite him falling down tracking. This is something we saw a lot with Marcus Mariota. Alamade Zacchaeus is the king of tracking footballs poorly. This is just really poor tracking. Like, that's the receiver fucking up. It's a great throw. It's a great throw. It's on target, about 25 yards downfield. Absolutely. So in classic Baker fashion, he has three arguably great throws in a row, and two of them are not caught. One of them is, and that's going to be enough, but shit. And then here, this is ridiculous. This is the most egregious holding I've ever seen. This is a tight end screen right here. Watch what 52 does when he realizes it's a screen. Grabs him. Does that look like a hold to you? I'll move my mouse so you can see more clearly. So that, that is the exclusive reason that ball's incomplete. And no flag, of course. So that's a routine throw because we don't look at box scores here. That's another routine throw, and this time nobody holds him, so he gets a first down. Some creative play calling from Sean McVay, and I think they pound the rock in from here. Yeah, 2-2 two -two Atwell with a rushing touchdown. So... In a fun turn, three great throws from Baker Mayfield on this drive. Only one of them completed, but when you have multiple great throws on a drive, it usually ends in a touchdown. And here, took a weird meandering road to get there, but it ended in a touchdown. Let's take a second because it's halftime to check out the chart. So far, Baker has the two great throws on that last drive and the one solid throw that we downgraded from great because it got barely tipped and it might have made the ball a little harder for the receiver to catch even though it did hit him in the hands he also had nine routine throws on target he had one missed throw and then he had the terrible pickable ball that got called back for a penalty that i don't think was related to the play so i'm going to count it against him anyway he had the two sacks that were both his fault because he's not processing well and then he had the one that there was nothing he could do he had that one positive run run where he broke some tackles and he's under siege he's moving around the pocket quite a bit 
I give this half a B minus because even though he has the same amount of positive and negative plays, he's been really accurate and he's actually made some transcendent plays, right? Any great or better throw, I call a transcendent play or a game-changing play. Even though one of them was dropped, having two great throws on one drive almost always leads to a touchdown. And mitigate that a little bit because of the interceptable ball and the two bad sacks, but I'm still really impressed. I mean, his floor is a C plus simply because he's been so accurate and he's been executing the little things all so well. And then you add in the positive plays that were that outweigh the negatives. I give it a B minus. It's just slightly above average. Like this is good enough football to win you a game against a team that's just as good as you on the roster, right? And while the Seahawks have a lot better roster, the Rams have better coaching by a little bit, so it you know it all evens out. Right now, Baker's playing well. Not great. Not even good, just well. One, two. So this drive's going to start off with a bunch of running, and the Rams are actually going to punch it in on fourth and inches. And by punch it in, I mean get to their own 39. And then here we're going to need the all 22, because Baker's got a clean pocket, a lot of room to throw, open receiver, and I can't tell where that ball goes. So to the tight copy, we must venture. This will be a really quick shot. We just need to see the catch point. Play action. Plenty of time, open receiver, although not as open as I thought. You still have the inside or the outside leverage right here. All right, yeah, it looks like the ball is just a little behind. It's not pickable. It's also not catchable. It's a bad throw. Here, Baker puts it on the tight end. It just gets over his head. I don't know how this happens, honestly. You look... It hits him. I, I don't understand what's going on here. That's a pedestrian throw. You got to catch that. If it hits you in your wrist and you go one-handed, that means you could have got two hands on it. Just catch the fucking ball, dude. This play, I'm of a couple minds. I'm going to need to see the all 22, though, so that I can figure out what the hell is actually going on here. I originally graded this as a negative run, but I got to see what's happening, right? Like from this, it kind of looks like Baker Mayfield just bails on the play, but we got to keep in mind it's third and ten, and he got immediate pressure. So right here, if there's a dude open, it's a negative sack. If not, or a negative run, same thing. If not, then it's a no-fault sack, and he's just trying to make a play. All right, so here's the top of the drop, and remember that we got to get to the sticks. So this isn't really viable just yet. They're in zone, so you're not going to be able to throw and run up, right? Because everybody's got their face towards the quarterback. They're going to be able to come upfield and make tackles. There's really nothing to do yet. There's really nowhere to throw. Baker's already under pressure and trying to bail. Right here, if there was something he could do... Yeah, there's not a lot going on here, man. You could try to flip this out, but it's a suicide ball, and it's probably not going to get you a first down anyway. That's a lot of chaos. I'm going to give him a plus movement for escaping the first sack and a neutral sack because there's nothing he could do there. I apologize for how long this video is going to be, but you guys always say you want more all 22, right? So a little play action on first down to get things started off. Baker rolling right, and that's a really good throw. It's really good. Rolling right, you got Kobe Bryant chasing you down, so you can't set your feet. It's a plus movement for getting out of the pocket. It's a plus movement for running on the or throwing on the run. Perfect placement, really good throw. Here they'll show you the tight copy. And that's perfect. It's literally perfect. I'm only going to grade it as solid because it was only about 14 yards downfield, but most other quarterbacks, I'd probably be giving them a grade. That's really good. So we come out and we do some play action to the left, and there's nothing open, so Baker takes off and runs. That's a positive run. And we're not going to go into the All-22 to see if he's seeing the field properly, because if you can pick up a first down, go ahead and do it, my man. More play action. I'm seeing a pattern, and Baker does a really good job of guiding Higby. So the way Higby's supposed to run this is he's supposed to run a curl right here. So he's supposed to end where my mouse is, and then 81's supposed to flatten out. And you basically get, if the zone goes with the tight end, 
uh, you throw to the first, well, <laughs> if the zone goes with 81, you throw to 89. And if the zone sits down on 89, you go to 81. That's the idea. Instead, the defensive linemen sniff it out, and Baker's fucked. So he does a really good job of directing traffic, see the hand, telling Higby, cut back to the middle of the field, I got a little bit more room there. And he zips it in. So that's two plus moves and a routine throw. It's not that hard to make that throw, but it is hard to be that creative. So it's a positive play, good job. Yeah, Baker is constantly moving in the pocket today. I think a lot of the reason they're doing so much play action is just because they know they can't stop the Seahawks' pass rush, and that's frankly sad because the Seahawks don't have a great pass rush. Here's two more pocket movements. So he sets his feet. He looks to his first read. It ain't there. He bails out of the pocket to avoid this rusher. He then rolls left, sets his feet again, and throws a dart. Again, 14 yards downfield. Really solid throw. Really good play. Two-plus movements. Really good throw. Love to see it. Like Baker's playmaking here. He's feeling it. This play, I hate. When I saw it, 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 I got legitimately angry. I don't know why you would run this play on second and six, or really ever. It's a designed run. Like, Baker has no choice here. Don't run the ball on a designed run with Baker Mayfield. He's not that kind of athlete. So... That's a negative run, but I'm going to give him a bonus because that play was doomed from the start. Just like this one was. So that's a plus. It's a positive throwaway. And the plus move and the throwaway. And the Rams will live to kick a field goal and take the lead. But Sean McVay got really conservative on that last set of downs. And you just. You wonder what would have happened if they had been a little bit more aggressive, realized their quarterback's in rhythm, and thrown the ball downfield a little bit more, letting Baker hit those 13 yard routes that he was cooking on. You might have scored a touchdown, and that might have been enough to win the game. But let's go to the next drive. Drive eight's going to start with a lot of running, so we'll skip ahead a little bit, save you some time. When they finally get to passing, it's play action roll left, and Baker is screwed from the start. This is a no-fault sack. Like, okay, the earliest he could possibly throw is right here, and that'd be really hard to do. He takes one extra step, and that's why he gets screwed. That's not his fault. That's a remarkably quick pressure. And again, I think that that's why they were running so much boot bootleg and play action. It's just to buy Mayfield time so that the receivers can get downfield while he's carrying out the fake, hoping that they're hoping that somebody will get open so that he can make a split second decision as soon as he gets out of his rollout. It's not a great scenario. This is what happens when you have a backup offensive line and backup receivers. So on third down, they'll just throw the screen, routine throw, and they'll live to fight another day. The Rams will come out running, so we'll skip that play and get to some more play action. Here, Baker's under immediate pressure again and just has to get rid of the ball, right? It's another positive throwaway, but Jesus Christ, is he under siege. Here, a straight drop back, a little bit of time in the pocket, and Baker delivers a really good throw to Van Jefferson on the outside. It's a solid throw. Good job. 10, 15, or 10 12 yards downfield. Throws the out, perfect placement, in time, great. Or not great, solid. Got to be careful with my adjectives, right? Okay, this play is going to give me fits. If Baker completes this ball, it's probably a wrap on the game, because they're going to be in field goal range. Plenty of time in the pocket. Does a really good job of progressing through all of his reads. Clean pocket, good throwing form, and he puts the ball on Van Jefferson, but a little behind. Let's go to the tight copy and see just how on him he was and how far behind it was, because this replay, unfortunately, cuts off right at the good part. This is exactly what I want to see. Thanks for the Fox graphic. You could have waited a second, buddy. All right, tight copy time. Let's check out that placement. As you can see, Van Jefferson's wide open, and Baker should be making a much better throw here, right? If the ball is where my mouse is, it's an easy catch and probably a really good run thereafter. Instead, it's on the back hip, and unfortunately, the All-22 is facing the wrong way. So, this ball is slightly behind. It's still catchable. It's very catchable. Van Jefferson just lets it go through his hands. Hits him in the back thigh. Like, it's bad placement, but it's very catchable. Frankly, I think this is a routine throw. 
I got it in super slow-mo here on probably the best view we're going to get. And as you can see, ball's in the hands. If Van Jefferson makes a hands catch, he's got it. That said, Baker does lead the defensive back back into the play. I tell you what, because we gave Baker the solid throw on the one that was tipped but almost perfect, let's give him a bad throw here just to fight any bias. But again, look at that. This is the difference between winning and losing this game, is whether or not this ball gets caught. You would like to think that a better receiver than Van Jefferson makes that catch, but it wasn't the right throw either. Right? And the, you know, We're trying to grade the quarterback in a vacuum. Just because New Hopkins makes that catch every time does not mean that it's a good throw. So we'll call it bad. So to finish off this drive, it's 3rd and 15. The Rams are just going to go deep. Baker's got a clean pocket. He's kind of got a guy, but he sails it out of bounds. Bad throw. Nothing to it. Bad throw. So two bad throws end that drive for the Rams. And again, if Baker would have been a foot to the left on that second to last throw, the Rams probably win this game. One, two. After some supremely bad officiating gives the Seahawks a last gasp at life, uh, the Rams just need a field goal to probably win this game. And so they're going to come out real conservative and run it, and then they're going to come out and empty and sling it. Baker just got to make that throw. It's basically the same thing he did on the second to last play. I don't know what the hell's wrong with him and Van Jefferson, if it's a timing thing or what. Baker puts it behind him. It, like all these crucial throws, it, it's the same thing too. It's catchable. It's certainly catchable. It's probably even routine. But all of these throws that are just a little bit off, they keep on coming when Baker targets Van Jefferson. I don't know what the hell it could be. I know Van Jefferson is not a great receiver, but I can't imagine that it's just miscommunication. Here, Baker does a really good job of breaking a tackle and getting out of the pocket, and he rolls out, makes a solid, well, let's call it routine throw to Tutu Atwell. But once again, it's a tie game. There's a minute left. Instead of Going for the throat and trying to win this game that means nothing to the Rams, Sean McVay punts on fourth and two. Another conservative issue, uh, another conservative punt decision by McVay costs his team. Another slightly inaccurate throw by Baker Mayfield costs his team. And it's picking nits. It missed by centimeters, but it missed. And then there's a 31 failing to keep the ball out of the end zone on. I think the third punt of the day for him. Not not a great day for this Rochelle kid. I don't think he'll be playing too much more special teams. All right, so we've arrived in overtime, and if you are watching this video, you probably know what happens next, so let's fucking see it. Start off with a little motion. This play is just a buttfuckery. Again, another really stupid play by McVeigh that I don't understand why he feels the need to run it. The offensive line is getting demolished. Don't get fancy in the backfield. But I gave Baker a neutral sack on this play because, like, I don't even think it was a pass. He just got immediately enveloped. And I gave him a plus move because he didn't fumble the ball, and he really could have. Like, right, this is honestly impressive. The fact that he has the wherewithal to pull that handoff out and say, fuck it, we're aborting the play and take the sack, that's actually clever of him because this could have been cat catastrophically bad and it wouldn't have been his fault at all. It would have ended in the exact same result as this game, but with no blame on Baker. Instead, this. Like I said, <laughs> when he targeted Van Jefferson in this game, it all went badly. I don't have to tell you, that's a pickable ball. Holy shit is it. Let's see this replay, and then we'll get to the All-22, and I'll show you exactly why this is so, so bad and so uncharacteristic. Let's start off with the sideline copy and see if we need to go to the tight. But as you can see, it's a really simple play. It's a max protect. He's got two receivers, and it kind of works. Right here, Van Jefferson is open, and it's really far downfield, right? So the launch point, because I can't tell where the line of scrimmage is anymore, the launch point is about the 13-yard line. And the ball falls at about the 33 of the other side. So 13 plus 33, 46, making it a 54 air yard throw across field. That's tough. Not a lot of dudes can do it, but Baker certainly can. 
I don't think arm strength was the problem, though. After listening to Baker Mayfield's post-game press conference explaining this throw, it looked like what Baker, or it looks like what Baker was trying to do is take the gimme. So you could try to make a perfect throw by putting it up here, letting Van Jefferson run under it, and get a touchdown. Instead, he said, all I need to do is get a field goal on this drive. I'll be safe. I'll underthrow it so he can definitely get a shot at this ball, rather than possibly overthrowing him and ruining the play and getting nothing. Instead, Baker Mayfield underthrows it. This ball should be out here on the sideline. He leaves it in and short. Now, it's okay to leave it short, because your receiver can turn around and jump for that ball but he doesn't put it far enough out to the sideline so Van Jefferson doesn't have enough separation from Diggs to make that play. Now, it's a really good play by Diggs, and Diggs is one of my favorite safeties in the game. I've always had a soft spot for him going back to his days at Texas and even Detroit. But you'll see here, Diggs has already got his hips flipped. He's going to run over. You, basically, the only two defenders on this play are Diggs and the sideline. So you put it closer to the defender with no hands, right? Just put it on the sideline. Protect him. Let him catch the ball and walk out of bounds, get hit through the back, fine. This ball isn't even that short. The shortness isn't the problem. The problem is that it's not far enough to the sideline. Now, Jefferson doesn't do a great job of coming back to the ball. He could have made this look better. But regardless, it's pickable. And it's a crucial time to throw a pick. Because that's game. There's no more film, and I honestly don't think that the tight copy will add anything. So let's just get to the charts. So remember that there were a few plays that we were iffy on. I'm going to give you the harsh outlook and the optimistic outlook, and they're not that ac they're not that different actually. The optimistic outlook is that that first throw that Baker Mayfield threw to Higby, this one, I'm going to put the video. This could be great. If that's great, then all of a sudden Baker Mayfield has a 5.5 slugging score. He has more positive plays than negative, and it's a B minus C plus game, right? Because even though that's a clear B, I'm going to downgrade it because that pick was so catastrophic and dramatically bad, right? Like it's one thing to throw a bad pick. It's another to throw a really bad pick that could have been a huge play. And it's another to throw a really bad pick that could be a huge play in crunch time, right? That's, that's got to be worth a half letter grade in my opinion. So instead, Instead of a B, the, hope, the hopeful, optimistic, nice look at Baker Mayfield, what I would argue would be the biased look at Baker Mayfield would be that he got a B- minus in this game. Now, I think that the excessively harsh look, if I give Baker no benefit of any doubt, if every slightly off ball is bad, and if that great, possibly great ball to Higby is actually bad, uh, then you're looking at a C to C minus game, right? He would still have a positive slugging score, which makes it hard to be a C minus, but he'd have more negative plays than positive plays. His accuracy would be about league average. And again, that crushing interception downgrades you a half letter grade. So I'd give him a C minus. I think the fairest way to go about this is to find a middle ground. And that middle ground will put us at a C. Now, I know that that last pick looked terrible, and I know that earlier in the game he got really lucky not to be picked off a second time. But Baker Mayfield also made some really good throws, and he was under constant pressure. 24-plus pocket movements is up there with Justin Herbert for one of the most chaotic pocket games I've ever seen. And it's not like Baker's running around out here for no reason. The Rams were doing everything they could, keeping Max protects, bootlegging him, etc. And he still couldn't get away from the Seahawks front four. They weren't even bringing pressure that much. It's just that the Rams could not block anything. You look at the sack totals. I have him down for being sacked six times. Two of those I blame on Baker. The other four are just out of his hand. And you have to watch the all 22 to figure out who to blame for sacks. And that's exactly what we did in this, this video. But like watching it on the broad Broadcast, several times I thought, in fact, the first time I graded this before the All-22 came out, I had four sacks being on Baker and two being not his fault. And when I went back and watched the All-22, I'm like, yeah, he gets to the top of his drop and there should be somebody open, but there isn't. And I showed you guys, there's just nobody open because bad receivers versus a good secondary. So on the whole, Baker was slightly above average, 73% accuracy. Remember, league average is about 71, 72. That's not impressive. It's about a C. Remember that a C is perfectly average to me. As far as his positive plays go, I have him as having one more negative play than positive play, which isn't great, 
Remember that the average positive play rate is 24% and he's rocking a 21.6. The average negative play rate is about a 29%. He's rocking a 27. So he's really just towing what I call the DAC line, the perfectly average starting quarterback line. He didn't fumble, but he did throw the two picks. He got sacked twice. That was his fault, but also four times that weren't. He had two positive runs, so his legs were a little bit of a weapon. And he had that one negative run, but remember, we're not going to hold it against him too much because it was just a terrible play from the get-go. You wouldn't run a quarterback sweep with Tom Brady either. Not to say that Baker Mayfield's as unathletic as Tom Brady, but he's certainly not in the tier of quarterbacks as far as mobility goes, where you design runs for him on second and long. It was a pretty low volume game as far as passing goes, and it wasn't exactly the friendliest of conditions, being that it was raining, his offensive line was porous, and his wide receivers were not good. That said, I know what it is to grade Baker Mayfield film. There's nuance to these things, but Baker Mayfield is easily the most posterizable quarterback in NFL history. It is so incredibly easy to dunk on him for every little thing he does. Because you can watch this game, and if you turned it off right before overtime, you'd be like, you know what? Baker Mayfield played a pretty good game. And, and here's how close this is. Uh, like, we, we have the two throws to Van Jefferson that were nearly really good, like game-changing plays, but he, he just barely missed, and we're being harsh. We're grading both of those as bad. Let's say we live in an alternate universe where instead of Baker throwing a terrible underthrown inside pass on that last play that gets picked, let's say he just leaves it up a little bit higher in the air, or he puts it a little closer to the sideline and Van Jefferson comes down with it. All of a sudden, this C game that we're lamenting becomes a B plus game, right? You turn that interceptable into a great, his slugging score goes up to a seven and a half, he's got exactly as many positive and negative plays, and he's at a 77% accuracy. That'd be a pretty damn good game, especially considering how much pressure he was under because they couldn't block anybody. But that's not how life works. Baker Mayfield made a decision. He wanted the safe play. He wanted to leave the ball up high so Van Jefferson could catch it. And he left the ball inside because of it. If he, who knows, if he had stepped into his throw and driven it and tried to be perfect, maybe he would have been. And he would have been a hero throwing a walk-off touchdown, dragging the Lions to the playoffs. But he didn't. This is arguably Baker Mayfield's worst game as a Ram. I would argue that the Packers game was a little bit worse, but take your pick. One was in the cold, one was in the rain. It seems like maybe Baker Mayfield's just not any good at playing in adverse weather. Maybe he's a warm weather quarterback. I don't know. Maybe he's a dome quarterback. We haven't seen it yet. That being said, he played pretty well in Cleveland in the bad elements, so I don't know. Could have just also been bad timing, playing playoff teams with a bad offensive line and backup receivers. His Rams career, to the extent that it is over, was a little bit checkered. He was amazing versus the Raiders and the Broncos, and he was good versus the Chargers, but he was below average against both the Packers and the Seahawks. Overall, that's still pretty good, and, and quite frankly, like, let's keep it real. Half of you are here because you're Baker haters that are Browns fans and you love Deshaun Watson and want to venerate him. Baker's worst game is a Ram, whether it's Green Bay or Seattle, is still better by a significant margin than anything Deshaun Watson did in Cleveland this year. You'd love to think that maybe if he got in a situation where he got a full training camp and he got a competent coach and he had an offensive coordinator for, you know, more than a month that knew what the fuck they were doing, he could clean up those silly little mistakes. Because he basically the problem is that he's making rookie mistakes, but I have a hard time blaming, blaming him for making rookie mistakes when he's been with this Rams team for six weeks. Before that, he had half a training camp with a terrible... Carolina Panthers coaching staff that couldn't get out of their own way no matter who their quarterback was. And before that, he played a full season with a torn shoulder and a bruised knee and a pulled groin. And the year before that, he actually looked really, really good. So like, I wonder what would happen if God forbid Baker Mayfield got two years in an offense with a decent or better offensive coordinator and no injuries. But He's probably not going to get that. He's probably spoiled his chance. I I don't know. I don't, I'm not a reporter. I'm a film evaluator. I think he probably gets a starting job next year, but if he does, it's probably not for a team with a great offensive coordinator or else they wouldn't be looking for a quarterback in the first place. My wet dream is that he signs on with Miami as a backup, outplays Tua in camp, and steals his starting job early in the season. But enough speculation. We got all summer for that. My thesis, you want it quick? Baker Mayfield played a lot better than people are giving him credit for against Seattle, but it still wasn't any good. The playoffs start in a few days now. I like to call it pumpkin season. Why? Because the playoffs are when the clock strikes midnight and all those quarterbacks that people thought were a carriage, they turn right back into pumpkins because scheme fades at midnight, right? The magic fades at midnight. I'm going to be doing a series I call the pumpkin report where I break down all the quarterbacks who were fraudulent throughout the regular season and get exposed in the playoffs because I think that's when the truth really comes out most of the time. But until then, I'll be here grinding film. Asta.